My name is Gail Porter and I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, which is NIST, one of your commerce sister agencies. And we're, I'm excited to be here today to uh, continue in this very exciting series we've been hearing about. <laughs> and uh, I know a number of you might have come to these other um, sessions on uh, enterprising women at commerce. And today we're going to be talking with Lori Lacasio from NIST, who's one of our senior executives at NIST. And I want to give you just a couple of minutes uh, introduction to a little bit, to a minute on myself and maybe three minutes on NIST, so you kind of know where, where we are and why why we're the coolest place you may not have heard of before coming to Commerce. <laughs> uh, so I've been in a public affairs field for more than 30 years, and I've been at NIST for 27 of those years, and I'm still there. Um, our director likes to ask people, why do you stay at NIST? And I stay at NIST because it is literally a fascinating place to work. Um, it's an excellent place to work in all of the ways you like. It has a child care center. It ha if you live in the area, it's an easy commute. If you if you don't, maybe not so much, but, uh, and it has an incredible array, a diversity of science and technology topics. So if you are a geek, it is geek paradise, because it's not just one field, as many um, science agencies specialize in a single field. NIST is extremely diverse. We cover computer security, we cover chemistry, physics, um, engineering, um, every field, healthcare, diagnostics in healthcare, um, every field you can think of is pretty much examined in some way because the, the, the theme at NIST is measurement expertise. NIST is your nation's measurement experts. We have the laboratories that specialize in making all the different various measurements that are necessary for modern life. They all tie back to NIST at some point. So when you get a mammogram, and you have radiation um, from that mammogram, we know the radiation is safe for you because there's been some measurement and a traceability back to NIST to how much radiation you're receiving. When you go to the store and you buy lunch meat, that traces back from the states, from the store to the states, to inspectors, to NIST for mass measurements, which are done in Lori's lab. When you get, um, fly on an airplane and they need to know where they are, the navigation systems are all tied back to NIST timekeeping, which we're most known for or the nation's timekeepers, and the barometer that's in the plane that tells it how high in the sky it is. All of those things need to be measured very accurately or modern life basically doesn't work. Your cell phone doesn't work, internet doesn't work without the measurements that are done at NIST. So I wanna segue from that to talking a little bit about uh, Lori. So Lori um, is one of our stellar scientists. Uh, she's an inventor, she's a scientist, she's a manager. It's pretty cool. <laughs> she she pre pretty much can do uh, just about anything and um, she's a member of our NIST Senior Leadership Board, which is a group of the directors of our laboratories as well as the directors of our other major programs. We have programs that assist manufacturers across the country. We have programs that are internally focused to assist the research staff in doing their job, so support or administrative programs. And that whole group of maybe 15 to 15 or more people, Lori is on that, that group. And she manages a very large laboratory, one of the largest laboratories at NIST called the Material Measurement Laboratory. And that laboratory has a very diverse set of topics from forensics to healthcare to um, uh, other types of clinical, um, other types of uh, chemical measurements at the tiniest, tiniest scale. They d develop instruments and develop measurement methods for measuring chemicals in the environment. That's another large uh, er area for this uh, laboratory. And so um, Lori's task is to keep all of that running with 900 employees and visiting scientists because one of the coolest things about NIST is that we have our own staff of federal employees but we also collaborate, um, Pat, with very many different kinds of companies and academic people. We have a lot of postdoctoral research candidates at NIST. And um, so there's a certain number of employees, but there's almost as many technical people who are visiting scientists as there are employees at NIST. And we work carefully with them because that tells us where technology is moving. What do we need measurements for in the future? Very frequently in our laboratories, we're looking at something that is going to be in the marketplace in 10 years, and we help to make sure that it can enter the marketplace accurately and confidently so that consumers will buy these new products and know that they're being measured properly and the performance is understood well. 
So um, Lori has worked her way up through the ranks the hard way with lots of hard work, being cre creative and being an excellent scientist. And um, she's been director of this lab since uh, 2012. And so I want to start off asking her a few questions. We're going to have a conversation for a little bit here, and then we're going to open it up for questions from you. So um, as the head of this lab, um, you have a huge portfolio and so many different tasks and parts of your job. Um, is this what you thought you would be when you grew up? I mean, what did, what did you think uh, years ago when you were first deciding to be a chemist, she's a research chemist by background, uh, is this what you thought you would be? Is this what you aimed for or how did you get where you are today? Um, so absolutely not. And, <laughs> and I would say that it's interesting because if you're a scientist at NIST, if you know a lot of scientists, a lot of them, I think, are really born to be scientists. You know, they have that vocation. They, 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 they were, came out of the womb sort of playing and putting things together. I, I wasn't like that, really. And I always say I wasn't born to be a scientist, but I was bred to be a scientist because my father was a physicist. And, uh, and I was uh, born into a family full of boys, into a very traditional Sicilian family full of boys. And um, none of the boys liked science. So my father didn't give up. <laughs> and he knew one of us was going to be a scientist. And he, he never made me feel like a girl couldn't be the one, the scientist in the family. He always really groomed me toward that once he found that I was good at math and science. And so, um, so that's sort of how I got into it, just um, being, I guess, bred that way. My father telling me, all the stories about science that he loved and his desire for one of us to go in his footsteps. And so I'm the one that did. Um, it turns out after that, I went, I, I got a degree in chemistry, a BS in chemistry. And then um, I had two minors, one in mathematics and one in bio, biosciences. And I really started to love the biosciences. So I went on uh, to graduate school for a master's degree in bioengineering out at the University of Utah. It was the time when they were starting to uh, develop the first artificial heart, and they did the first implantations in humans in my program and into Barney Clark when I was there. Um, but I left that program with a master's degree because I really didn't know why you would need a PhD. And, uh, and then I left and I found a job at NIST. I moved back east where my family was. And, um, and then when I was working at NIST, I realized, you know, if you don't have a PhD at NIST, it's 70% PhDs, you really can't, in my vision, I, could, I did, couldn't see myself being successful like I wanted to be. I wanted to be a top researcher in the US. Uh, that's what I wanted. And I knew I couldn't achieve that if I, if I didn't have a PhD. So luckily, I had a fantastic boss who is now the director of NIST, Dr. Willie May. If you haven't had a chance to meet him, He's really phenomenal and very supportive of, of career advancement for really everyone. Um, but he encouraged me to go back to school, and he let me do that full time. Um, so that was basically my job, was to go back to school and get a PhD, which was fortunate because at that time I also had three young boys at home. Um, so I didn't have to do my work at NIST and do my work at school and then go home and raise my children. I really could focus on that as my job. Um, and that was really very, very fortunate for me. So I got my PhD. I came back to NIST. And I worked my, I, I, I told you I set out with this goal then to be at the top of my career, a top scientist in my area and my field. And I set for myself a goal of being 40 by the time I did that. And what that meant was really having the people in my field, the top researchers, Harvard, Yale, um, Stanford, acknowledge me, and also get invited to top conferences, start to organize big conferences, um, publish in the big journals like Science and Nature. And by the time I was about 41, I had really achieved that. And, and that was uh, wonderful. And, I had done it with so much support from so many people and so many mentors. Um, I will say, you know, it wasn't without interesting blips along the way. So uh, when I was invited to my first committee meeting, a big committee full of people, these senior researchers, um, 
One, uh, I was put into a small group, it was a DARPA panel, and I was put into a small group to brainstorm about the possible next big thing that they might fund at DARPA. And it was about a, a room of um, 40 people, all of us divided into groups of five. So we were put into circles with five people, and I was the only woman in the room, but at this point, the only woman in this group of five researchers. Um, one of the men, who was really a top scientist, the the top scientist without a Nobel Prize in the United States, I would say, very well known, um, was sitting next to me. And he had his back turned toward me, which is really hard to do in a circle, right? That's really hard. <laughs> so the body language was clear that he was uncomfortable with me being there. Um, and every time I tried to speak, he, he just cut me off. And so finally, I realized I just I, and I was very polite, and I would back off because he's the top researcher in the United States. <laughs> so then after a while of this, I realized I just have to yell out my idea. So at one point, I just blurted out my idea. And he turned to me like this, and he said, wow, that was a good idea. Now, who are you, little girl? <laughs> like that, right? So that, those were his exact words. Um, it was kind of interesting way. He acknowledged me in one way. He, he looked at me. He knew I existed. Uh, he acknowledged that it was an interesting idea. But it didn't change the dynamic until a lot later, until I sat in a lot more, on a lot more committees with him. Um, but I found that to be um, not pervasive, but ex it existed. So I, I will say that that did teach me something, that I do have to remember that not everybody is going to welcome me into the room, and they might not be welcoming me just because I'm a woman. You know? so, and that was something I, I don't think I had ever said al aloud to myself before, before that happened. Um, now, um, most of my experiences are, are positive, but that's just one thing that, that taught me a lot along the way, I think. Um, so after, after, after school, and I went back and I achieved uh, a lot in my career scientifically, I, I really looked for the next challenge. I like to be challenged. I like to be intellectually stimulated. And I felt like I had some things that I hadn't really, talents that I hadn't really used yet. And, and those were my people skills. Science is not really about people skills. Um, that's okay, but it's just not. So I felt like there were some things that I could really, um, some talents that I might have that I could use to benefit the organization in other ways. So a position came open at NIST as a division chief of the biochemical science division, and I applied for it, and, and I got that, um, that job. Uh, that was a great uh, job for me. It was really fun. Um, I learned a lot about working with people. Boy, I didn't know anything about working with people, <laughs> and I just learned a lot in that job. Um, and, then, and then years later, about seven years later, uh, again, I started to feel like I wanted another challenge, and this position came open, and so I applied for it and got it. Um, I will say that, that the, the then director of NIST, um, when he offered me the job, uh, he said, uh, I'll, I'll offer you the job, but I want to put you in an acting position. And I said, there's no way I will take an acting position because that would basically undermine my ability to do anything in this job. Um, and uh, and I, I wondered, because I, as a woman, I, I felt like I was being, you know, I wondered right? <laughs> if, it were, if there was any gender uh, um, bias there that was unintentional, clearly. And, um, but I did say that there were, I just didn't feel that that, that that would be a good thing for me to do, to take that job and not have the full authority of the position. And if he gave me that position, I would gladly step out of that position if he asked me and I wasn't doing the job well enough. Um, and you know, in the end, uh, it clearly wasn't gender bias. It clearly was kind of a test. <laughs> to see what I would say. And, and so it was interesting to me that, um, that along the way, don't always, don't make assumptions about what people are thinking, but do, do stand up for yourself. And beca just because you're a woman, don't think you can't stand up for yourself. And I think that that was the lesson for me there. Um, so then I, I took this position. It's been a, a great position. My di first director, Pat Gallagher, 
Pat Gallagher, who I worked for, was stellar. My second director, Dr. Willie May, who I'm working for, amazing. Both of them extraordinarily supportive of, of me and my career. And, uh, and so I, I love my job and my, and my current team. So uh, thank you. That's, that's really cool. It's I, a long-winded. I, <laughs> I haven't heard many of those anecdotes, so this is very cool for me also. Uh, and one thing I want to follow up on is I think STEM careers, science, technology, engineering, and math careers are very well, uh, they're dominated by men. Um, that's reality in our society today. And I, you, you've mentioned a couple of little anecdotes, but um, outside of NIST, do you find that the environment in, um, when you go to meetings of your peers uh, across the country is somewhat different in different organizations across the country? And how, how do you feel um, the status of women have changed since your first um, interesting episode in the circle with uh, the, the uh, top scientists at in the U.S., have you noticed any change in the um, culture or in the acceptance of a diverse number of different types of people in science and STEM careers? Yeah, I, I would say the attitude is, is so much different than when I first started. And when I first started, I was probably the only woman at the table in many of the four that I sat in. Um, I would st say that's still probably true, sadly. I'm usually the only woman there. Um, at the table, which is interesting that that hasn't changed. I don't know why that hasn't changed yet, but the attitude is entirely different. It, I, I really don't feel treated differently than any man at the table. So, I, but there is still there still aren't other women at the table. So that's something that we really have to work on. Yeah. Well, that that leads to my next question. So, what do you think could increase that? Is it because women? just aren't interested in these careers? Or is it that younger girls aren't getting encouraged enough still? I know there are lots of programs yeah. currently in place to help uh, not just young girls, but a diverse, a more diverse group of people broadly to go into science. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, thoughts about what can be done to imp increase the number of uh, diverse, diversity of people in STEM careers? You know, I wish I had good insight into that. I, I would say there are a lot of people studying it um, one of the things that I've noticed, though, that, that, that has been out in the, in the press and a lot of people have been writing about it is that women don't support women, right? That's, that's what they say, women don't support women. I, I don't know if that's true. Uh, I don't know if it's true in your culture. I don't know if it's true in our culture. I haven't felt it, but I don't have a lot of female peers, so it, it's hard for me to know. Uh, it is interesting, though, that they say that because, because there was clearly the good old boy network in science, as I grew up in science, and there clearly isn't a, a good old girl network in science. You know, we what we've done is always make sure that we fit in, right? Um, because we are uh, a minority. Um, so there, but we don't. I think we try. I, it's interesting because I, I read a book recently, and I was I was I, I related to this anecdote that was talking about, you know. You don't really want to always try to fit in and ignore the people who are like you, right? So, um, who might be around you that are like you. So, as a as a as a woman with um, maybe you know a room full of men and one other woman, I don't want to ignore the women just to show the men that I fit in with them and not with her, right? So, there's an anecdote I think in the um, book Lean In, I think that talks about that. And the disadvantage of, of, of that kind of tactic of really alienating the people, you know, any people, of alienating anyone, um, it, it is, it's important not to alienate people and to avoid the people that are like you just so you don't stand out. So, I, but I would say as far as support um, or why, you know, what's the root cause of women not going into science? I don't know, we, we have a lot of programs at NIST where we're trying to pull more women into science, but, and, and I do everything I can to try to um, hopefully promote women in science. Uh, we have some tremendous women who I hope take my job someday, and I told that to my boss very recently. Um, but yeah, still we're underrepresented at the top. 
So clearly, in this environment, whether it's male dominated or not, you've been very successful. Mm -hmm. You've risen to the top of your field, and, yeah. the, and um, just so you know, no bragging, but NIST has some of the world's best scientists in, in many of the specialties that we, we have at uh, the agency. So if you're at the top of the NIST hierarchy, you, you are almost by definition at the top of the world's hierarchy in those fields. So given that you've been so successful, what do you think are the elements that helped you get here? What are the, the things that are your strongest suits or the things that you find um, you bring to the table that um, have allowed you to, to um, have the job you have and to be successful at it? Um, I think uh, I'm very goal-oriented, I think. Uh, I have um, probably, though, my, uh, let's say probably my favorite strength, and they say women are really bad at this, too, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> at telling your strengths. First you tell your weaknesses, and then you, you'll, you'll put in a few strengths. So I'll just say what I think my favorite strength is. And, uh, and honestly, I think it's um, my vision, that I have vision and, and a belief that almost anything is possible. Uh, so I love doing things like strategy and thinking about the future and where we can possibly go and, and pulling people toward that. That's my favorite part of my job. It's, it's, it really invokes all kinds of creativity and creative thinking, and that's, that's fun for me. Um, I think a few other strengths. I'm a, I'm a people person. Uh, I really enjoy working with people. I think I'm a compassionate leader. Um, uh, I'm a team builder. I like to build teams, but also I rely on teams for, for everything. I think uh, I love having a group, a diverse group of people with different ways of thinking around me to, 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 uh, to bounce off ideas and to, and to think of places we can go and directions we can go. And um, probably throughout my career, one, thing, one strength that has been really important too is that I'm not intimidated by any task or any, any, any room or any table or any, you know, who's at the table or any job that's put forward. Um, I don't always succeed, but I'm not afraid to try. And I think that's been very helpful. Do you have any, so do you have any weaknesses? Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> no, I had those first. But uh, the weaknesses are probably all the opposite things to that. Um, so um, I, was, I was talking to, to my chief of staff, Mary Soderfield, right before I came. And, uh, and she was laughing. She was saying, that, that's right on the money. Because uh, one of the things is I'm not very detail-oriented. I'm a smart person, so I, I can do detail, but I don't love it. So what I do is I, I build up a team with people who not only are good at that, but who love it, right? I don't, I don't want to just push stuff on people that they don't want. People, like I love visioning. Some people love getting in the details and getting that task done. That's their passion. So I definitely build up teams that are complementary to me. Um, I also, though, I would say in, in building up that um, the team, I mentioned, you know, compensating for my lack of detail orientation, but I also will say that, you know, when I do visioning, I also need at least one other person there who can see through those rose-colored glasses with me, right? So not everybody can, can do that. So I don't want to have a team full of me, but I definitely want to have at least one other people who can, who can look through their rose-colored glasses and, and want to go in that direction too. Um, some other weaknesses that I have, um, because I, I like to think blue sky, sometimes it's really hard for me to ground myself, and so I don't see the difficulties with carrying out that task. Do you, you know? <laughs> so, so I will give you an example. I was sitting in a room with um, my deputy director, and it was the first time we had really met, and after two weeks, we had been talking and talking in, in several meetings brainstorming, which I love to do, on what's next, what, what's next for the laboratory. And he would go away, and I didn't know what he was doing, but he would go away and he'd start doing these things, right? He'd put together a list, he'd make an action plan, he'd build up the team to do it. And, and then he'd come back to, he came back to me two weeks later and he said, I have way too many things to do. And I said, I didn't want you to do all of those. I, we were there still brainstorming, you know, that was just, we were still in that phase. So he got, we just, hadn't talked to each other. So 
he was completely overwhelmed and stressed out by that time because he had a billion things that he thought he had to implement. But they, it was just a lack of understanding. Um, but yeah, not seeing the difficulties or limitations and then really limiting or putting myself into like, okay, prioritization and here's where we're going and we're all gonna go together. That's, that's something that I've really learned to do, but that, that's hard when you're a real blue sky person. Um, I'm highly competitive because I grew up in a, in a room full of brothers and as I said, a very traditional Italian family. And um, um, that's good and it's bad. It's good uh, when you're in the lab and you want to be the best scientist. It's bad when you're at a team of your peers and you need to negotiate, right? So you want to make sure that your team, you know them, you understand what motivates them, you understand, you know, they can understand where you're coming from and that sometimes you're going to be going together even if you are normally a very competitive person, you're going to do the best for NIST, not for my laboratory, for NIST, for DOC. And so I have to put that competitive nature sometimes in check for the benefit of the organization and I've really learned to do that in the past couple of years and that's been extraordinarily helpful, truthfully, for, for the team that I work with. Um, and, and actually, uh, I, I have a horrible fear of public speaking. <laughs> I, I do, I just do. And I speak in a room full of a thousand people often, and uh, I hate it. <laughs> I'll just tell you, it's a weakness of mine. It took me, uh, I'm just starting to get better or more used to it. I, I pra you know, I'll stand in front of the mirror and practice four times, right? An hour long talk, I practice four times. Unfortunately, I couldn't practice for this, so. <laughs> Maybe but, that's your problem. Practice, <laughs> too much practice actually is bad for you as a public affairs specialist, let me tell you that. <laughs> but it's, uh, it, it's something that very few people know about me, but I, I am, it's, it's hard for me to get up in front of a bunch of people. So that segues beautifully, actually, to what my, my last question, and then we want to open it up to all of you to ask your questions. So do you find, in your experience, and as a people person, that do you find that men and women have different strengths and weaknesses in, um, who work for you and in the culture of this, this STEM culture that you're in? Um, or do you find that what makes someone successful in that environment is the same, regardless of who you are? Um, there are... There are differences and there are similarities. And I, I would say that what I've been trying to learn a lot about recently is communication, because I, I think that's the key difference to me. You know, you think about um, empathy and the way you treat employees. You see male bosses, you see female bosses that are both good and bad at that, right? That doesn't seem gender specific to me. My, my boss, uh, Willie, is a very empathetic leader. Um, but I will say that, um, that, uh, that communication seems to be a really key. You know, we have gender differences in the way we communicate. And that's okay. That's been studied extensively, but we've seen a lot of talks on that. Um, for a while, I started thinking, okay, so how am I going to train all the men in the room to understand how I communicate? And then, you know, I realized we're adaptive, so that's what we do naturally. We adapt to communication styles. So if I'm in a room full of men, I actually speak differently than if I'm in a room full of women. Um, honestly, I interrupt more. It's gotten to be really bad because I'm usually in a room full of men, so sometimes my girlfriends now are like, <laughs> you're, getting, you're carrying some bad, bad things home. But I, 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 do, I do different things depending on who's in the room and what kind of person they are too. Not, not saying all men interrupt each other in a conversation, but, but in my peer group, we do talk on top of each other. So if I don't put my voice in there, at the beginning I was raising my hand. You know, I was the only one raising my hand. <laughs> and I was waiting for somebody to call on me because, you know, that's polite and nobody would call on me. And finally I realized, oh, I just got to get in the mix. And so the way I communicate there is very different than the way I communicate with my friends, with my children, with my husband, with my peers. Um, so it's just adaptive communication, really. And uh, I think it is good to train people so they're cognizant of the decisions they're making. Um, but, I do, but I also think it's my responsibility to be adaptive, to know my audience, to speak to the audience in a way they can understand, because it's my message I want them to get. 
Um, if I walk away and I feel like, gosh, they didn't get my message and I didn't get to speak, you know, it's not their problem. <laughs> it's my problem because then I, I, I really lost everything. So, so I've learned to be more adaptive and also to be cognizant. I've learned what I can do to be a better communicator. I, I have a male-dominated organization. I think it's about 70% male, um, maybe higher, maybe 80%. So, uh, so 800 out of 1,000 people are, are men. So I, 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 I've been studying this to try to understand the things that I might do that turn them off or that don't communicate my message when I give maybe a large town hall. Um, I, haven't, I haven't achieved that yet. That's in my IDP this year. So uh, yeah, individual development Indi individual plan for those who don't plan, know. Who don't speak acronym. Who don't speak acronym, yeah. <laughs> but I will say that there are things that I think are probably more importantly um, the same. And those are, you know, working hard, communicating your message, um, taking some risks, uh, communicating your successes, but also I think something really key is taking ownership of your failures because that shows confidence. And it also shows that you have taken a risk and you're willing to own up to, to uh, uh, what wasn't a uh, success. So, and you're willing to learn from it too, which I think people love to see. So I think those are very common themes that I see as far as um, you know, tr strategies for success, in, uh, you know, whether you're a man or a woman. Great. Great. So do we have um, questions in the audience? Um, people who'd like to sort of keep the conversation going in a particular direction? Yes. I'm taking um, a Stanford strategic decision making and risk okay. management um, um, course through, through NIST and, um, program. And one of the things that they noted is you know, how we can make a good decision and there are bad outcomes and things. Uh, and the reverse is also the truth, you know, the, the truth and probability. Have you ever found in your experience that you made a good decision and there was a bad outcome? And you know, how did you handle that, that event? Yeah. Oh, gosh, there are a lot of good examples of that. Um, but most recently, um, I th probably most recently, I, I did a major reorganization of my laboratory. Uh, so I did, um, when I first came in, I was only there for a few months. And then I put in place a, a, a major reorganization, which um, had so many unanticipated consequences that it was just shocking to me. <laughs> uh, I think that I had all the right intentions and it was very logical and it was very well thought out. And one of the things that I realized is that I hadn't communicated enough prior to the reorganization to make people comfortable with the big change that was coming. Uh, I don't know why, you know, I, but looking back, I think I didn't anticipate that people would think it was such a big change. <laughs> because for me, I actually am comfortable with change. Not everybody is. As a matter of fact, most people aren't. <laughs> um, so, so what did I do after that? Um, I had a communications director at that point, and we just did a major communications campaign. We, I talked about it very openly. I talked about the difficulties. I talked about what I thought was on the horizon, why this could be better. I told them all the things I thought I should have said before I did the reorganization, to tell you the truth. Um, and, and I had coffees and open meetings where people could just come talk to me um, openly. I asked for anonymous emails to be sent to me. Um, after that year, Think the temperature just went way down, and it was really just a mistake. You know, it was really a big mistake. It was a well thought out reorganization, and right now the organization is on a really good path. But it just the way I implemented it, I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. There's that word communication again. Mm -hmm. Communication really important. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, other question. Uh, my name is James Blackwell. I'm at the patent office as an examiner. Could you put the mic up a little? Sure. Um, I, previous to working at the patent office, I worked at NASA at Goddard Space Flight Center. 
And I noticed, uh, it, and I was in a support role for a, a whole bunch of uh, scientists, uh, astronomers, right. and physicists, and things like that. And I noticed um, whenever to, to encourage these guys to come and work, you know, at this time it was a, as a contractor, they would be given management roles. And I was wondering in your management roles, uh, how much um, are you able to do any science anymore? And is that a problem? I've noticed that most scientists don't make very good managers, number one, because they're more interested in science, yeah. and number two, uh, they're not trained in management at all or business or anything like that. And um, because they have the compromise between their science and their management, and also that was the only thing that paid them enough to be there as a PhD scientist, mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering how, how you have uh, dealt with that issue. Yeah. So when I became a manager, my direct um, division, my dark boss, my division chief told me um, as I was becoming a, a division chief, I should give up my science. And uh, he said the reason for that is, which was very hard to do, <laughs> very hard to do. He said the reason for that is because people will always perceive that I'm favoring the people that I used to work with, that I'm favoring their project, I'm favoring their science. Um, and I'm only grooming them and developing them. And if money happened to go their way just because they were doing good work, it wasn't because they were doing good work. It was because it was my science. So I gave up science, um, doing science hands-on. I still believe I influence science, but it's, it's a hard thing to give up. So I understand the difficulty in letting go of it. I think the best thing you can do is let go of it because it's not fair to the organization. Management is a different job. And so I stopped going to these conferences where I was feeling pretty good. <laughs> you know, I stopped and I started going to new ones where I didn't know anyone and uh, learning all about how to be a good manager and a leader. Um, it's, I would advise everybody to do that because that's a whole different, that's a whole different thing to learn. It's a whole different part of your education. You, I, as I said, I think I started out with some basic people skills, but managing an organization is very different, and there's so many nuances to decision making that you have to consider every day. So I, I think learning something new, you know, putting my energy and putting their energy into really learning and being the best they can possibly be at managing and leading is, is the best thing for the organization. It's interesting that uh, in this question, I want to just add something that's interesting about working at NIST. NIST has a very formal leadership training program mm -hmm. that I think you mentioned that sometimes it's hard for scientists to be managers because those skills are very different. And many scientists are very analytical and very dispassionate about the people side of things. And um, it's very difficult to make that transition. We've found that. And so um, we have this excellent program mm -hmm. that basically uh, allows group leaders who are the lower level management um, and the division managers who sometimes have 50 or you know more people under them to hand select people who show promise who are both excellent scientists and excellent and could be excellent managers with the right training because I think at NIST we believe that management isn't something you're born with it's something you can learn to do just like science isn't something you're born with sometimes you are tinkers and sometimes you learn it and so it can be a teachable skill and what's important to an organization's growth is that you are able to select a diverse group of people who have that right combination of strong science and strong um, ability empathy or compassion um, you know confidence, whatever it takes to be a manager. And uh, we start them out in foundations for leadership and then there's a program specifically for new leaders. So if you are a new group leader, you can be selected for a program. And it's quite expensive actually, but it's really valuable in the end with the improvement in the skills of the people who are running the organization. So do we have another question? Um, that's in the back. Hello. Overcome these obstacles and for leading others. 
Do I have to admit I haven't overcome them yet? <laughs> um, that's a hard one. That, you know, letting go of things and uh, delegating, learning that is that part, that last part that you said is a very difficult thing. Uh, I'm, I'm still learning that one because um, as I've built up my team, the one thing that I, I, I always do uh, at home when I had young children and at work is build up a team around me that really feels like family, you know, that feels so supportive, or, you know, so supportive. It's professional, but it's so supportive that it could be like that, you know, it's just a nurturing environment. Um, that said, still, I think almost every scientist has this um, difficulty in uh, assigning other people what they were going to do. You know, they just mic tend to be micromanagers, tend to hold on to details, tend to really like to take care of the tasks themselves and be perfectionist. And I think a lot of us are like that, where we just think we can do it better than other people, or teaching other people is gonna be harder than just doing it ourselves. Um, so what I've, how I've reframed myself recently, and this is helpful, um, and I've had a lot of support to do this, is to try to understand that the people around me also need to develop. And if I'm doing everything, I basically am doing all the learning and they don't get to learn and grow and succeed. And, and when I could reframe it like that, that actually makes it easier to delegate because then I'm feeling like I'm contrib contributing to their career, really, as well. Great. Did I answer all your questions? Yeah. Yeah. Great, yeah. we have another question in the front. Uh, you said you're goal-oriented and competitive, and I'm just curious where you see your career going in the future. What is your next great ambition before you know, you reach the end of your career, which I hope is long. Oh, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, it's interesting because every seven years, I think, I don't know if it's a natural cycle, but every seven years I just feel like I need to be challenged again. Maybe it's five to ten years, but I just really feel this need. I feel a little bored, like I need a new challenge, a new job, a new intellectual stimulation. So I would say every five to ten years, five to seven years, I've really looked for shifts in position or in a uh, place that I want to go in the organization. Um, and I've looked outside. And I've been very honest with my boss about that every step of the way. Every boss I've ever had, I say, I'd say, at this point in my career, I want to explore academics and I want to just go interview. And they've been very supportive, saying, don't leave, but here, you know, you need to make this decision. The greatest thing about that is every step of the way, I've gotten phenomenal offers and found that I love NIST, right? I love NIST. <laughs> so I, every step of the way, I've decided I love NIST. And so every, every seven years, I choose NIST. And so that has made me, I think, a really good employee of NIST because I've chosen it. And so what I do with my employees, and I'll get to your answer, to answer your question, I'm not trying to ignore it. Um, is to try to ask them to choose NIST too. So they don't get bored or burn out or start to hate their job or, you know, you, what you can, right? It's a long career. We've got 40 people at NIST stay 50 years. <laughs> so it's a long career. You can really get burnout. out. So, um, so if people, I encourage people to come to me, talk to me. If you're bored, let's talk about it and start to look at different place, different things they can use to do to use different talents. So I've started to make some, I think, really unique positions at NIST that aren't just bench scientist or manager. They're, they're sort of external communications and liaison to the White House and you know a whole bunch of different fun things, congressional affairs. And I've also um, now, we've expanded our activities since I've been director to two additional sites, one in Stanford uh, on the Stanford campus where I have placed employees and one in Hawaii where I've placed employees. Um, so now this gives them six, six different sites to the, that they can go, New York, South Carolina, Hawaii. You know, so if they're starting at Chicago, um, Boulder. Boulder, thank you, my favorite. Um, so all these places where if you're bored, let's, let's think about this. Let's really think, is it place, is it job, is it, you know, you're just not being challenged. So. Um, so that said, there's only really one more job I can apply for at NIST. Um, 
Um, so that'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> But we'll see. I, I haven't really made made it made it decision, but I have made a decision this year that I love Mist again, and I'll, I'm definitely staying. So, but I've only been in this Good. job two years. <laughs> Great answer. Great answer. So there, there we see one of the ways that people are successful is confidence. <laughs> so I didn't say I was applying for no, it. No, you don't have to. You, you don't have to apply for it. You, but you you show that confidence in your in your the way you interact with people, and I think uh, they they feel it. Um, anyway, uh, another question. There's one up here at the front, or there's another. Oh, oh, here we wait for the mic. We, we're taping, so we want people yes. to actually hear you. Hi. I'm Nahala Ivy, and I'm at NIST as well. And um, I just more of an observation. It's kind of fascinating to hear you speak. I'm new to NIST. I'm only one year in, and um, in a management, you know, role. And uh, I come from a business environment, so private sector, and came into government after that. And what's very interesting is the commonality of that experience that you've had related to the scientific. Um, community similar in business. I was one of you know few women in my classes and I think that that's a really interesting observation that you said in your sphere of influence that you have to get yourself out there, put your, your, your opinion on the table. I think in the business environment that I've carried through in management is very much that aspect of you know, put, put your opinion on the table, don't ask to be asked, you know, don't yeah. wait to be asked. Yeah. And um, oftentimes that allows uh, for that influence to come through the content or the idea, uh, you know, it, of course how you present the idea can, can either turn off people or, or not, but I think just getting, getting the idea out on the table often by itself can, can stand, you know, provide validity. So just to share that comment, it's been interesting to hear your Thank experience. you for sharing that. Great. It's good to know that it's, you know, it's similar. Um, outside of the government. So I've never actually worked outside of the government. Yes, there's a question over here. Hi, I'm Paul Relayson, and I'm in the TV studio. Uh, it's a pleasure hearing you today. Uh, Thank you. Quick question for you. Uh, I've always wanted to see uh, the, the laboratory. I uh, want to know if you can get a tour up there at some point. Or? Absolutely. <laughs> That's good. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> can I? Actually, I can give them a global answer, too. OK, yes. But, okay. but I am going to get you in direct touch with Mary Satterfield, who's my chief of staff. And she will organize a visit. But yes. So we have this uh, wonderful program at NIST that we've done every year that you probably do at Commerce also called Take Your Child to Work Day. Or take your, it used to be Take Your Daughters to Work. And then it was Take Your Daughters and Sons to Work. And we've just shortened it to Take Your Kid to Work. But it's a, a really cool program at NIST where we try to encourage. We have grandparents bringing their grandchildren. We have other Commerce employees who could um, potentially bring their children because um, sometimes if the same child from NIST's parents comes every single year, we try to keep giving them different places to visit. We have laboratories where they can make, make concrete uh, in the lab. Um, they generally start at age um, 9 or 10. Is that correct? Mary worked with it several years ago. but. Uh, for children that are that young, um, that's the, the main way that we get children that young at NIST to actually interact in a variety of different settings with different kinds of scientists, maybe a vision scientist, maybe a computer scientist, maybe our net zero energy house, which is very cool. It has computerized little people um, <laughs> that have the moisture of a person, the electricity and heat of a person, and they, they wash the dishes, but they're all, it's all organized by computers. And then we, we test how to, um, come out with using solar energy and other methods, um, not use any energy over the span of a year. Um, Hunter Fanny spoke at this very setting about this not that long ago. At any rate, so that's one opportunity for other commerce employees. It would help to have sort of a sponsor at NIST who can help, um, maybe you could swap and you know their kid could come to your take your kid to work day and your kid could come to ours, but that's an excellent program. And then Mary Satterfield is their chief of staff up here in the front row. <laughs> I will say that I'm just going to tell you this for full disclosure. None of my three sons turned out to be scientists, but, <laughs> but, but I'm sure I can. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be a positive influence. So I love science. I thought they would be, but. <laughs>
One more little plug I want to make about NIST is that in the Public Affairs Office, we love STEM education, but we, we don't have the same um, funding and um, outright mission that NASA does, for example. Someone said they came from NASA. Um, NASA is, you know, to dream for because they, when I w once spoke to one of their groups, they had 200 people who were either communicators or educators. Yeah. They have a very vibrant, robust program in STEM education. NIST has a much smaller program, but we do have a really good program too. We, we train middle school teachers in the summer. We have a two-week program for middle school teachers to come to NIST to learn about science. That's excellent. And then they train their colleagues back home. We have a new uh, superheroes series that we're trying on video and an animation. If you want to look at our YouTube channel, uh, it's called the SI Superheroes, and it's about measurement superheroes. We've we've made some characters to represent time and temperature, and um, you know, uh, Dr. Dr. Um, Kelvin is our temp is our superhero for temperature, and uh, Candela is our superhero for light brightness, et cetera. It's it's a fun thing that we're doing for fifth and sixth grade students, so for younger students. Uh, so anyway, we agree with you, STEM education is really valuable and that's one way we can get a wider range of kids interested. So do we have any other questions in the audience? Great. Thank you. You've achieved so much success and, and you've referenced your, your boys also. Um, for, for mothers of young children, I have a two-year-old at home and another on the way. Do you have any advice for staying on track with your career goals and your career ambitions? Um, yeah, you know, I found some things that were very useful for me. I mean, I mentioned this support system where possible, but I also found um, most important for, thing for me in both situations, home and work, while I was balancing those two, was to be present. So I'll say that, I'll, I'll describe what I mean by that. Um, when there was an important meeting at work, I did everything I could to shuffle my home schedule to be there. When there was, you know, it didn't matter what time it was, when there was a deadline, when my boss really needed something, when there was something very high visibility, when my, something really key on my performance plan, those are the things I just clearly prioritized and I was there. And I went part-time and I don't think that they knew I was part-time because I was always there when they needed me, right? They don't need you all the time. They need you when they need you. And then at home, I did the same thing. I really prioritized all the things I needed to be there for. I shifted my schedule so I could be there when the kids came home from school. And then during the week, I made sure I could be there for teacher meetings and you know all these key things that, and soccer games, and you know all the key things that were, uh, that were important for, for my child to know I was there. And, uh, and it was interesting because when I always felt guilty, uh, both places I felt just guilty. I think men and women do th these days because men take a big part of roles in uh, child rearing as well these days. But I always felt guilty, and like I wasn't giving enough of myself to either place. But that was the strategy that I found was very successful. And then um, when my son, middle son was in high school, um, he's a sensitive one, he's a musician, and he was in high school and he, he, I said to him, you know, I feel guilty, I feel like I'm never doing enough. And he said, um, he said, you know, I don't want you to be like other moms. I think it's so cool that you're a mom who works and is so successful. And so I didn't hide from him that I was what I was, and he became really proud of me. And then, uh, and I'll just share this because it's very fresh in my mind, but just very recently that same son said to me, um, you know, I, I just realized that you're the only person in the world who loves me unconditionally and who always has. For me, that, from a 23-year-old boy, that was really cool. And that's what it's about, right? Is it, and so all these other activities, that I always felt so guilty because all the moms had time to plan the activities. <laughs> I just didn't. And uh, so it turned out it's OK. He, he got the point. <laughs> so that, that, was, that was great. So the balance, the strategy is one thing, but the, the outcome is what we look for. I think I think we just heard another reason why she's successful. She's very good at setting priorities. <laughs> yes, Someone in the front, yes. And congratulations. Laura. Yes, congratulations. That's <laughs> fantastic. I'm Samantha from NIST. You know me. I've had the pleasure of working with Lori since I've been at NIST or under Lori's leadership. But as you have transitioned to management roles and 
people have differences in opinion or they don't like the decisions that you're making or it's difficult, how do you learn to, as a people person, not take it personally and to not take it to heart and have that affect how you manage and how you do your job? Yeah. Actually, it's interesting because I, I learned pretty early in management never to take anything personally because, I mean, that is the key. Just learning how to do that, somehow distancing yourself and compartmentalizing your business person and your, your feelings is really important. So I can honestly say that that's probably the greatest strength. I never take anything personally and I don't take anything home. I mean, I don't. I don't feel it at home. You know, I don't feel like, oh, I let that person down or they were really angry at me. I don't carry their anger or anger. I, you know, and, and I would say that what that also allows me to do by distancing myself is to stay very calm in a heated argument. And I know that's a, something else we all have to, to take to heart because I get a lot of people coming up and yelling at me, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's, it's surprising. And, um, and I, I can stay very calm. And uh, parenting might have helped, <laughs> but, but it's not, it's not, you don't have to be a parent to do it. It's having a close sibling or something. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I think just trying as hard as you can to distance your feelings. And remember, it's just work. It's just work. It's fun Great. work, but Great. it's just work. <laughs> do, we have, do we have any other questions? Yes, over here. Hi, my question is, um, has mentoring been a part of your success, and if so, how so? If what? I'm sorry. Mentoring. Mentoring. Oh, gosh, yes. So I, um, you know, I had a big influence on my father, but my, my, my most important mentor has been uh, really one person, and that's been uh, Dr. Willie May, who's at, uh, our director. Uh, he's the one that hired me at NIST. Um, and, uh, and really been a, a key mentor for me. I haven't had any female mentors throughout my career, um, but as I said, there weren't a lot of role models. The most interesting thing, though, is that there was, there was one very powerful woman director who came before me, and her name was Catherine Gebby. She was the head of the physics lab for a long time. Um, and she is, uh, she's um, not, no longer the director of the physics lab in the reorganization. There's a new director. But I have decided to meet her every Wednesday for drinks at Dogfish. <laughs> so I can start to learn about what she knew. You know, she, she was, I think, director in the 19, well, she came to NIST in the 50s, I think. Yes, she's been at NIST a very long time and is very highly respected yeah. at NIST. And she, she absolutely served as a mentor for many younger women, women throughout her career. Right. And so recently I just decided that I was going to ask her to come back and not come on campus and mentor me, but really, let's just be socially. I want to hear your story. Uh, and, uh, and I was reading in one of the books, I, I think again that was Lena, that they said, you know, don't, don't say mentor me. Because I remember asking my former director, Pat Gallagher, can you mentor me? Because I'm sitting in on these. I was, at that time, just got named to be a, a chair of a White House subcommittee. And I really did, had never done that before. I didn't know any of the people, and I didn't know the politics. I didn't know how I was supposed to act. So I said, can you mentor me? And uh, it didn't ever happen because it wasn't specific. And in the book, Lean In, if, you, if you've read that, it's controversial. Some people love it. Some people hate it. But there are some interesting points in there. And one of them is, you know, don't just say mentor me. It's um, find a specific thing that you want to work on and ask them for advice in that area. And then if you, a relationship develops, that's great. And that's when you end up having what I would say a mentor and not a mentoring, ex just a mentoring experience. Um, for me now, this, this, this every Wednesday beer with a uh, former director has become a real mentoring experience now. And, she, and I think uh, it's turned into, it's really helped me figure out, for instance, that what Samantha just talked about, which is distancing myself from, from, uh, from that, you know, the argument. So. So I wanted to ask you a, quick, a quick follow-up to that while you were talking. That yeah. was interesting. So I, as you were talking, I was thinking many people don't know what mentoring means, and you yeah. just said the same thing. But when Dr. May was your mentor, what did he do for you that you considered to be mentoring? Well, I'll tell you what's funny about that. I, I didn't know he was my mentor 
until he asked me to go give a talk. In fr he won an award, and he couldn't accept the award, and it was for mentoring. And he asked me to go give him a talk, a talk on his behalf to accept the award in this really big forum because I was, he had mentored me. And I thought, oh my gosh, he had mentored me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really about uh, you know, the, tip of the, the little, little advices that he get, the little advice he gave me along the way. You know, pick your battles. Don't come to me with every problem. Solve most of things, and then you know, be selective about what you come to me. How to act in a meeting. You know, how to you know things that he wasn't really telling me, but there was, he wasn't. I wasn't meeting with him on an hourly basis, but he was sort of constantly saying, "Remember this, because you're in this environment now. You're no longer a scientist." He's the one that told me to give up being a scientist, for instance, and to do my job, concentrate on being a leader. Um, so yeah, so it, was, it, it developed, that relationship developed over a long period of time of a lot of little advice uh, giving. And then, and then uh, so then that's how that developed. It wasn't really, I would say, as deliberate as other people seeking out a mentor. But, um, but now I have, and at this point in my career, I have, um, I have chosen to do that by this relationship with this other person. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? So it can take all kinds of forms, I guess is what I'm saying. But if you have a specific, I would really think about that. If you have something specific you want to work on and you want to be better at, um, you know, I'll talk to somebody about it who you think is really good at that. And, and if the relationship develops, that could be a lifelong mentor. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Karen. I actually have a question myself. Um, I, I have a question about science. Um, have you found in your career that men and women have any different approach to how they deal with the science itself? Yeah. It's funny because I, used, I, I really love to read about differences with, <laughs> and similarities, I guess, with, with gender. And so it was so obvious to me that I was the only woman for so long that I used to voraciously read about it. I had read this one study that was really interesting. And they said that if you put teams of uh, two women together, two men together, and a man and a woman, the man and the woman in the, in the laboratory to do some science project, the man and the woman were always the most successful. Right? So that's, that's really interesting. So what they said was that the women, women team, um, and this is just data, so don't take anything personally. <laughs> the women team tended to wander around the problem, change directions too often. Like before they got to the end, they would change directions too often along the way. Uh, the men tended to beat their head against the same wall over and over. Um, Again, this is data. <laughs> and the, man, man, the team that was a man and a woman, they tended to go fastest because they would change course, but it wasn't you know, so quickly. So that, that was interesting to me. So early on, I thought, OK, I want, I want a diverse team. I want people who think differently, because obviously, that's the quickest way to answer. <laughs> right? And, and uh, that, just from that little scientific data, I thought that was, that was a really fun thing to observe. Um, no, so in the laboratory, yeah, men and women, I think, do, I, I didn't notice anything so blatant as that in, the, in scientific research when I was going through. But I always did have a diverse group of people, and I felt that science was always just blossoming when it was, when it was like that. Yeah. Yes, so, someone in the front here, yes. You've talked about your career trajectory and um, some of the great opportunities that have arisen sort of along the way. Um, another lean-in point yeah. is um, this idea that sometimes women will screen themselves out of opportunities yeah. as they come up, you know, sort of thinking, well, I don't have those skills, I could never do that. Um, did you ever experience any, any of those feelings? And um, if so, how did you know which opportunities were ones that you should legitimately pursue? Um, absolutely, I, I, I do start with that feeling, like, I can't do that, you know, that's too much for me, what if I can't adapt? Um, and then I also come up with the, the feeling like, okay, well, what if I do apply and I don't get the job? 
I can come up with a lot of excuses for why I didn't get the job <laughs> and justify why I didn't get the job. So I've got to at least try because then I can, you know, I'm sure I can convince other people that it wasn't really me. <laughs> so, you know, it's sort of overcoming my fears. Yeah, I start with that fear. I don't know. I, I, when I read that, I wondered if, you know, a lot of people feel that way. I know a lot of men, a lot of women, um, maybe it's maybe it's built more in women, maybe it's not. But I did notice that point, and do I can honestly say that yes, I've had that feeling. Um, and then once I'm there, I'm just there, and and I forget about that. So. So one thing that strikes me while you're talking is um, uh, a, a, a tremendous optimism. Yeah. That it can be done. You know. That okay, well. Even if that happens, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Even if I don't get the job, it's not the end of the world. So that optimism, it seems to me, I've read something recently too, is something that's a sign of, of some of the strongest leaders. You have to have some optimism that the future will be good. Otherwise, it's hard to lead people <laughs> to that better to that future. Path. You know, So um, that's one thing mm -hmm. to just, if you've got optimism, little, little fire of optimism down there in your belly, that's mm -hmm. one thing you could sort of flame a little bit more because it, I think it helps, it helps make you not worry so much about fear and, and uh, what other people think necessarily, just it'll be okay. Yeah, and I think the most important thing is, yeah, to be optimistic, but also to realize that if you don't get the job, is that, is that okay? You know, is, that, is, that, is it worse than not having the job anyway? <laughs> right, because if you didn't apply, you wouldn't have the job, so it's the same. It's the same outcome. It's just a little embarrassment, maybe. That's the worst part. So do we have any other questions? Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you for okay. staying so long. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so great. I think is, um, I was wanted to make, uh, if, us, there's, if there's any other questions, we can do one more question. I think we have till 12.15, but um, if not, oh yes, one more? Okay. It's not so much about careers, but about scientists as communicators. So I, um, my entire career until I came here a few years ago was doing, uh, I had at media relations in large labs like NIST. Okay. So constantly encouraging scientists to communicate to the public. And just as an aside, I do, th you know, in the later years I did, it did seem that women were, were more willing to try to do that than the men, but I'm not saying that's in, you know, written in concrete. But um, my question is this. So um, as a hobby or volunteer work here in my job here, I teach plain language workshops. I actually did one, at, Gail invited me to do one at NIST a few years ago, and I was still sort of starting out. So now I'm, I'm planning to leave commerce and I want to go back to science communications and teach scientists and all technical, other technical thinkers how to communicate clearly. So my question is, as I embark on this new role, I have some ideas, but in, from your perspective, what would be the top one or two incentives or hooks that I could use to get those scientists who are perfectly comfortable talking to their peers off in their labs and don't really think it's important to talk to a broader audience. Yeah. A broader audience even at a science meeting, you know, just to expand. What, what would encourage, say, NIST scientists to be interested in learning that skill? So, I know this answer <laughs> because I was a scientist and I loved my work and I love my research and there's only one thing that motivated me and that is having enough funds to do my research, <laughs> right? So making my research possible. So what I've been trying to tell people is, you know, if you don't communicate your science, you can't, you might not be able to do your science, right? Because people won't understand why it's important. They won't understand the impact there will be no desire, therefore, to fund it, right, through proposals or other mechanisms. And there will no, be no desire to support it, to succeed and to grow. So that's the, you know, I think once you really get at that, that's the heart of all the scientists. They just want their science to live, 
and they want to have the chance to do their science. And so if they don't communicate it well, it will die. And that's, I think that's just very, very simple. Um, it's all about getting the funding to support their work and getting the, the support to, to continue their work. So, yeah. I, I want to add one thing to that that I found at NIST, which is um, we have four Nobel laureates. I forgot to mention that in the beginning. We like to brag about that. I'm and, not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and all the Nobel laureates at NIST, with possible exception of one person who is more analytical, but basically at least three out of four for sure, are excellent communicators. And how did they get to be a Nobel laureate and be excellent communicators? Because if you communicate excellently, you will get the recognition you deserve as well as the money you reserve, deserve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and often, if you cannot do that, no matter what field you're in, it's you true. will not be recognized for the good things you've done and or get the money you need to keep your programs going, whatever that program may be. So, and the smartest scientists can talk in English. You can tell them that too. That they love to be the smartest person in the room. That's a, I witness that at NIST almost at every meeting I attend. <laughs> uh, so if you know that strong communication is the sign of a, of a very smart person who can understand other people's points of view and talk to them, then that's another incentive because it shows your intelligence. <laughs> so, um, so I've had a lovely conversation here. This has been fun, oh, and too. I want to make sure I give a plug to the next. Um, speaker that we're mm -hmm. expecting for this wonderful series, uh, Dr. Catherine Sullivan of NOAA, the administrator of NOAA, will be the next um, speaker on February 24th, so I hope you'll make uh, that, put that on your calendar. And also, uh, Judy Rink Rinky, did I say that correct? Rinky. Rinky of ITA will be, we don't have a date yet, but we're expecting. She's, she's upcoming. She's upcoming in the next, so just watch your email. And Karen? I'll just add one more to the list where um, it's not a secret. We've been trying to get the secretary. Um, hopefully that will happen one day. Um, we've also got Michelle Lee, of, um, who is hopefully going to be confirmed as the head of PTO. She's um, April or May, I think. We're also going to have a um, group of senior women attorneys do a panel. And um, in June, for Father's Day, we're going to have a panel of commerce men um, come up here and talk. So appreciate everyone coming out today, even though it was a little bit snowy, or at least uh, we have to talk to Noah about that. They, not as much as we thought, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, appreciate you all. It was, it was a fun conversation. Thank, Thank you. you.